Have you ever stopped to think about how religion, especially the kind of organized religion that tells you how to live your life, might actually be holding you back? I'm not talking about spirituality or personal beliefs here. I'm talking about the giant, institutionalized system that claims to know what's best for everyone, no exceptions. From a skeptic's point of view, religion hasn't just been a comforting answer to life's mysteries. It's also been used as a tool for control, mass control, keeping people from asking tough questions or seeking their own truth. Take a figure like Christopher Hitchens, one of the most outspoken critics of religion. His book God is not great pulls no punches. He goes straight for the throat, saying religion poisons everything. His argument? Religion isn't about uplifting people, it's about keeping them in line. Look at the history of religious institutions, and you'll see what he means. Wars, crusades, inquisitions, all driven by religious power hungry for control. Hitchens makes the case that religion has survived so long because it plays on fear, not because it provides any real answers. It feeds off uncertainty, selling salvation like it's the latest product you have to buy to save your soul. But here's the real kicker, it's not just about ancient wars and crusades. Even today, religion still holds sway over governments and laws in ways that make us question who's really running the show. You see it in policies on reproductive rights, same-sex marriage, and gender roles. The message is always the same, obey. And that's the part that bothers skeptics the most. It's about obedience to an idea that, let's be honest, hasn't exactly aged well in the era of science and reason. Galileo is a prime example. Back in the 17th century, this brilliant astronomer was out there, with his telescope, proving that the Earth wasn't the center of the universe. What did the church do? They didn't celebrate his discovery as a step toward understanding God's creation better. Nope. They shut him down. House arrest, trials, and condemnation followed. Why? Because the church wasn't interested in truth or science, it was interested in maintaining its narrative, the one that conveniently kept the people in awe of its authority. Skeptics will tell you that Galileo was just one of many minds pushed into the shadows because their ideas threatened the religious power structure. And it's not just Christianity. Across the board, religion's modus operandi has been to stifle dissent and force conformity. In Islam, for example, critical voices within or outside the faith are often labeled heretics or apostates, subject to persecution or even death in some extreme cases. In ancient Hinduism, the rigid caste system was justified by religious texts, keeping entire populations locked into predetermined roles for centuries. Religion, skeptics argue, consistently takes the reins of moral authority, dictating how people should live, love, and think. And then we have modern-day conflicts. Take the never-ending tensions in the Middle East, where religious divisions have fueled wars, terror attacks, and political unrest for decades. For skeptics, religion isn't just outdated, it's dangerous, a ticking time bomb that ignites whenever its fundamentalist fuse is lit. But wait! Before we write this off as just a bunch of atheists shaking their fists at the sky, let's think about what all this means on a personal level. Religion often tells you who you should be, what you should believe, and how you should act. It creates rules about how you're supposed to navigate life, like a script that's been written for you before you even had a say in it. Don't think for yourself, just follow the steps, pay your dues, and maybe, just maybe, you'll be rewarded in the afterlife. That's what makes skeptics so uneasy. Where's the space for individual thought in that kind of system? Thinkers like Bertrand Russell, one of the most prominent agnostic philosophers, couldn't accept this blind obedience. He posed the question, can we even know if God exists, and if not, why should we devote our lives to a set of rules built on uncertainty? Why should people submit to authorities that may be rooted in myths or, at the very least, are unverifiable? Russell's skepticism encourages us to demand proof, actual proof, and to reject the notion that religious institutions should have the final say in what is right, wrong, or moral. Skeptics also point out that religion doesn't have a monopoly on morality. In fact, some of the worst atrocities in history have been committed in its name. From the Crusades to 9-11, religion has often been used to justify violence and oppression. 
and yet, it continues to wield immense power over global politics and everyday lives. People are conditioned to believe that questioning these institutions is dangerous, even blasphemous. Skeptics, though, argue that not questioning them is even more dangerous because it allows outdated beliefs to dictate modern life. So where does that leave us? For skeptics, it's all about freeing the mind. By removing the shackles of religious dogma, they believe people can truly begin to understand the world and their place in it through reason, science, and critical thinking. They're not saying you have to be an atheist, but they are saying you should be able to choose what to believe based on evidence, not fear. To them, the real danger isn't Satan, atheism, or agnosticism. It's the blind faith that keeps people locked into an ancient system that refuses to evolve. And with more and more people waking up to that realization, it's no wonder that Satan, as a symbol of rebellion, is becoming more popular than God. The skeptics see Satan not as a deity, but as an idea, an idea that defies the established order, that questions authority, and that demands freedom to think, explore, and create without the fear of eternal damnation. And that's why, in their view, the appeal of Satanism or atheism isn't evil, it's liberating. Here's where it gets really interesting. In a world increasingly driven by personal freedom, self-expression, and a rejection of traditional authority, Satanism has emerged as something far beyond the creepy, ritualistic stereotype. It's not just some fringe movement, for many, it's a bold, unapologetic rejection of the rules they've been told to follow all their lives. The Satanic Bible, written by Anton Levy in the 1960s, marked a significant shift in how people understood Satanism. It wasn't about worshipping an evil being, but about flipping the script on religious control. Levy Satan was a symbol of defiance, individualism, and personal empowerment. The Satanic Bible wasn't just a manifesto, it was a declaration of war on moral authority. Satanism, in its modern form, takes a very humanistic approach. At its core, it's about rejecting the notion that there's an invisible force dictating what is right and wrong. It's about owning your decisions, living authentically, and recognizing that no divine judgment should control your destiny. When Levy founded the Church of Satan in 1966, he wasn't setting out to create a new religion, he was offering a path to absolute self-liberation. And that's why, for so many people, Satanism today feels more relevant than traditional religions that are still stuck in the past. You might be asking, why Satan? Why has this figure, historically painted as the ultimate villain, become the poster child for freedom and rebellion? Well, look at how Satan is portrayed in literature. One of the most famous depictions comes from John Milton's Paradise Lost. In that story, Satan isn't just some chaotic, evil force. He's a rebel with a cause. He's cast out of heaven not because he's inherently bad, but because he challenges the ultimate authority, God. There's this iconic line where Satan declares, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. That's powerful. It's not just about evil versus good, it's about autonomy versus submission. Satan's rebellion is about not bowing down to a ruler just because that's what's expected. For many modern Satanists, that sentiment resonates deeply. They see the figure of Satan as a metaphor for rejecting oppressive systems and embracing radical self-determination. The Church of Satan is clear about this, Satan, for them, is not a real being, but a symbol of human nature at its most liberated. It's not about sacrificing goats or casting spells, it's about tearing down the facade of enforced morality and embracing what feels authentic to you. What's even more interesting is how Satanism, as a cultural force, aligns itself with many of the progressive values that have gained traction in recent decades. Think about it, individualism, freedom of choice, gender equality, LGBTQ rights, these are all principles that the satanic movement often champions. The Satanic Temple, a newer group that's gained attention for its political activism, has been at the forefront of legal battles, arguing for the separation of church and state and for bodily autonomy. They've turned Satanism into a tool for challenging religious overreach in government, all while using the image of Satan as a cheeky, provocative symbol to grab attention. And here's the thing, this isn't just a passing trend. It's part of a larger cultural shift where people are tired of being told how to live their lives based on ancient texts and rigid traditions. 
For many, Satanism represents a way to push back, to say, I refuse to be governed by fear or by systems that don't align with my personal truth. So, when people choose Satanism over traditional religion, it's not about embracing darkness or chaos, it's about rejecting conformity and control. They're not looking for a god to worship, they're looking for a way to take ownership of their lives. This is why Satanism has found such a strong foothold, particularly among younger generations who are frustrated with institutions that seem more concerned with maintaining power than with fostering genuine spiritual growth. Satanism, as it's practiced today, is far more about self-empowerment than anything supernatural. It's a conscious, deliberate stance against being told who you are, what you can do, and how you should think. And while it uses the imagery of Satan to make its point, it's really about human beings stepping into their own power and reclaiming control over their own lives. It's about saying, I refuse to let outdated systems define my existence. What's truly remarkable is how this movement, with its roots in rebellion, has become a symbol for so many who feel disenfranchised by traditional systems. It's not about creating chaos for the sake of it, it's about creating a new order, one where the individual reigns supreme. So, here's the thing. We live in a time where people are more connected to information than ever before, and with that comes a serious shift in how we think about the world, especially when it comes to religion. Atheism and agnosticism are no longer fringe ideas discussed in small intellectual circles, they're mainstream, and their rise is shaking the foundation of traditional belief systems. Atheism isn't just about not believing in God. It's about rejecting the idea that we need a divine figure to explain the universe or dictate our moral compass. For a lot of people, atheism offers a sense of liberation. They're not bound by doctrines that tell them what to believe or how to act. Instead, atheism relies on evidence, science, and critical thinking. It's about saying, I don't see enough proof for the existence of a god, so why should I structure my entire life around that belief? On the other hand, agnosticism takes a slightly different approach. Agnostics aren't outright denying the existence of god, but they're questioning whether humans can ever really know if a god exists. For them, it's not about rejecting belief, but about remaining open to the idea that the ultimate truth may simply be unknowable. It's a stance rooted in skepticism and intellectual humility. Agnosticism doesn't close the door on the possibility of higher powers, but it doesn't let belief run unchecked without evidence either. Now, what's driving this surge in atheism and agnosticism? A lot of it has to do with the advancement of science. The more we understand about the universe, the more we realize that many religious explanations just don't hold up. Think about it, we've mapped the human genome, we're exploring space, and we have quantum physics breaking down the fabric of reality. In the face of all that, the idea of a divine being controlling everything feels, to many, increasingly outdated. This is where someone like Richard Dawkins comes in with his book The God Delusion. Dawkins argues that believing in God is not only unnecessary, but irrational in light of modern science. His point isn't just that religion is wrong, it's that religion, in many cases, actively stifles curiosity and intellectual growth by offering easy answers where we should be asking hard questions. Atheism also appeals to people because of its stark honesty. There's no sugarcoating, no promises of an afterlife, no grand narratives of divine purpose. For many, that's refreshing. It's the idea that life is what you make of it, without some cosmic overseer keeping tabs on your every move. It's about living authentically, based on reason and experience, rather than clinging to ancient texts that may no longer reflect the complexities of the modern world. Meanwhile, agnosticism speaks to those who feel torn between the mysteries of existence and the limitations of human understanding. Figures like Bertrand Russell, a leading agnostic philosopher, have long asked, can we even trust our own perceptions to truly grasp the concept of God, if one exists? For agnostics, it's not about rejecting belief altogether, it's about acknowledging the limits of human knowledge. The universe is vast, mysterious, and perhaps beyond our full comprehension. Agnosticism, in this sense, is about keeping the door open to possibility while refusing to commit to any particular explanation without solid proof. What's really fascinating is that atheism and agnosticism are gaining popularity not just among intellectuals or scientists, but across a wide spectrum of society. 
millennials and Gen Z, in particular, are turning away from organized religion in record numbers. They're not necessarily becoming hardcore atheists, but they're definitely more comfortable identifying as spiritual but not religious, or simply as non-believers. In a world that's increasingly global and interconnected, people are exposed to a wider range of beliefs, and that exposure makes it easier to question the dominant narratives they grew up with. The digital age plays a huge role in this shift too. Access to information has never been easier, and with that comes a growing skepticism of authority, especially religious authority. When you can fact-check any religious claim with a quick Google search, it becomes much harder for traditional religious institutions to maintain their grip on the truth. Add to that the rise of social media, where conversations about belief, or lack of it, are happening publicly and in real time, and you have a recipe for a massive cultural shift. Atheism and agnosticism also appeal to those frustrated by the contradictions and hypocrisies they see in religion. How can religious institutions preach love and acceptance, they ask, while simultaneously condemning entire groups of people for who they are? The disconnect between the teachings of many religions and the actions of their followers, whether it's discrimination, corruption, or violence done in the name of faith, drives many to reject organized religion altogether. Thanks to literature, especially during the Romantic era, Satan morphed into a symbol of defiance, freedom, and even heroism. It's almost ironic, right? The ultimate villain of religious texts turns into a cultural icon representing rebellion against authority. And this transformation wasn't accidental, it came from some of the greatest minds in literary history, and they shaped how we think about power, oppression, and what it means to be free. One of the most powerful examples of this shift comes from John Milton's Paradise Lost. This epic poem doesn't just portray Satan as some mindless embodiment of chaos and evil. Milton gave Satan depth, he becomes the ultimate anti-hero, challenging God's authority and refusing to submit. There's a reason why Satan's famous line, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven, still resonates today. It's the kind of statement that cuts through centuries of religious doctrine and speaks to the rebellious spirit in all of us. Satan, in Milton's hands, is a tragic figure, yes, he's flawed, but he's also courageous in his refusal to be controlled. And it didn't stop with Milton. The Romantics, especially poets like William Blake and Lord Byron, took this concept even further. They saw Satan not as an evil force, but as a symbol of resistance against oppressive systems. Blake once said, the reason Milton wrote in fetters when he wrote of angels and God, and at liberty when of devils and hell, is because he was a true poet and of the devil's party without knowing it. That's a bold statement, he's saying that Satan, in his rebellion, embodies the human desire for freedom. For Blake, this wasn't about theology, it was about art, expression, and the individual's fight against the establishment. Lord Byron, another giant of romantic literature, created characters known as Byronic heroes, figures who, much like Satan, defy social norms, reject the idea of servitude, and stand for radical independence. Byron's works weren't religious, but they tapped into the same energy that made Satan an attractive figure, rebellion against a world that tries to control you. These heroes aren't perfect, but they're compelling because they break away from society's expectations. So, what was it about Satan that resonated with these writers? Well, at its core, Satan's story is about standing up against a higher power, even when the odds are stacked against you. That's an incredibly human instinct, to question authority, to challenge systems that tell you how you should live. And during the Romantic era, this wasn't just a literary trend, it was happening across society. People were questioning monarchies, pushing back against the Industrial Revolution's dehumanizing effects, and fighting for personal freedom. Satan, as a character, fit right into this cultural moment. The Romantics weren't advocating for people to worship Satan in any religious sense. Instead, they were using him as a metaphor for the human struggle against oppression. In a time when the world was rapidly changing, when old systems of power were being challenged, Satan became a symbol of the individual's fight for autonomy. He wasn't just rebelling for the sake of it, he was rebelling because he refused to accept a world where freedom was limited by the will of a higher, controlling force. Fast forward to today, and you can still see this influence in how people view Satan in culture. 
From music to art to movies, the image of Satan as a figure of rebellion has stuck. Think about the entire heavy metal genre. Bands like Black Sabbath, Slayer, and others use satanic imagery, not because they're promoting evil, but because they're channeling that rebellious energy. Satan becomes a stand-in for rejecting norms, breaking free from societal expectations, and expressing individuality. Even outside of music, in literature and film, you see this portrayal of Satan or Satan-like figures as complex, misunderstood, and often relatable characters. In movies like The Devil's Advocate or Lucifer the TV series, Satan isn't portrayed as a mindless villain but as a figure with depth, motivations, and a certain charisma. He's the ultimate symbol of the outsider, someone who doesn't play by the rules and questions the status quo. What we're seeing here is the lasting impact of the Romantic writers. They gave Satan a kind of cultural immortality, transforming him from a one-dimensional figure of evil into a multifaceted symbol of defiance. And that shift, in turn, reflects the ongoing human fascination with rebellion. We admire those who stand against oppressive forces, who refuse to conform, and who carve their own path, no matter the cost. Now, we're entering the modern era of Satanism, an era where it's less about rituals in the dark and more about challenging the very systems that have dominated for centuries. When Anton Levy stepped onto the scene in the 1960s, he didn't just create a new religious movement, he ignited a cultural revolution. Levy's version of Satanism wasn't focused on worshipping a deity. It was all about embracing individualism, defying societal norms, and rejecting the moral codes that had been dictated by religious institutions for millennia. In 1966, Levy founded the Church of Satan, an organization that would take a radically different approach from what people traditionally associated with Satanism. Levy was a showman, a provocateur, and he knew how to grab attention. The Church of Satan wasn't about performing supernatural rituals to summon evil spirits, it was about using Satan as a symbol of rebellion and self-empowerment. For Levy, Satan represented the rejection of the guilt and shame often imposed by religious systems. His message? Live life on your own terms. The Church of Satan laid out its philosophy in Levy's The Satanic Bible, a book that has since become a foundational text for modern Satanists. And what's striking is how far it departs from traditional religious texts. Instead of commandments that enforce submission, Levy's teachings are all about self-preservation, indulgence, and personal freedom. Do what you want as long as it doesn't harm others is the core idea. The focus is on the here and now, not on some future reward in the afterlife. For Levy and his followers, Satanism was about rejecting the notion that pleasure and self-fulfillment were sinful, instead promoting the idea that we should embrace our desires without guilt. Levy's Satanism came at a time when society was going through massive upheaval, think about it, the civil rights movement, the sexual revolution, and the counterculture of the 1960s were all shaking the foundations of traditional values. People were questioning authority in ways they hadn't before. Levy saw an opportunity to tap into that energy, and Satanism became, for many, a way to challenge the status quo. It wasn't just about religion, it was about rejecting the oppressive systems that dictated how people should live their lives. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Levy's Satanism is fundamentally atheistic. That's right, the Church of Satan doesn't actually believe in a literal Satan. Instead, Satan is a symbol, a stand-in for human nature, freedom, and rebellion against arbitrary authority. The rituals they perform? They are more theatrical than supernatural. For Levy, these rituals were psychological tools to help people break free from the constraints of religious morality and embrace their full potential. What makes modern Satanism so powerful is how it reframes morality. Traditional religions often revolve around self-sacrifice, humility, and denial of worldly pleasures in exchange for some future spiritual reward. Satanism, on the other hand, tells you that you don't have to wait for an afterlife to be fulfilled. You don't need to suffer to be virtuous. Instead, it promotes the idea that life is about self-empowerment, personal responsibility, and taking control of your destiny right here, right now. As the movement gained traction, the Church of Satan wasn't just a niche group, it became a symbol of defiance against organized religion, hypocrisy, and the moral policing of society. And Levy himself? 
he became a media sensation, leaning into the controversy that surrounded him. He wasn't shy about using satanic imagery to provoke a reaction, knowing full well that shock value could be a tool for spreading his message. But here's where the real shift happens. The Church of Satan, while still around, has largely been eclipsed by a newer, more politically active movement, the Satanic Temple. Founded in 2013, the Satanic Temple has taken Levy's ideas of rebellion and self-empowerment and channeled them into activism. Unlike the Church of Satan, which tends to focus on the individual, the Satanic Temple has made waves by challenging the intersection of religion and government. They've taken on issues like religious freedom, separation of church and state, and bodily autonomy, using satanic imagery to make bold political statements. The Satanic Temple's approach is direct and unapologetic. For example, they fought legal battles to have satanic monuments erected next to Christian displays on public grounds, not because they believe in Satan as a deity, but because they're pushing back against the dominance of one religion in the public sphere. Their activism forces people to confront uncomfortable questions about religious privilege, government neutrality, and the role of faith in public life. What's fascinating is how both the Church of Satan and the Satanic Temple have used the figure of Satan as a rallying cry, not for evil, but for freedom, individualism, and justice. In a way, they've co-opted one of the most feared figures in religious history and turned him into a symbol of empowerment, challenging not just religious authority, but all forms of systemic control. For a growing number of people, especially younger generations, Satanism represents an alternative to traditional religions that they see as outdated, hypocritical, or overly restrictive. It offers a way to engage with the world on your own terms, free from the fear of eternal damnation or divine punishment. And in a time where authority is increasingly questioned, where institutions of all kinds are being scrutinized, Satanism is appealing as a path of self-determination. Now, we've all heard the phrase, knowledge is power. But if that's true, then why have so many powerful institutions throughout history been so eager to censor or ban certain books? What are they so afraid of? Books have always been seen as a threat to the status quo, especially the ones that challenge mainstream religious ideas. These banned texts often hold radical ideas, presenting alternate perspectives on history, spirituality, and human nature. And the fact that they were forbidden only makes them more intriguing, doesn't it? Take, for example, the Book of Enoch. This ancient Jewish text didn't make the final cut for the Bible, but it's packed with wild stories about angels, giants, and apocalyptic visions. One of its most controversial ideas? It expands on the story of the fallen angels, portraying them as beings who shared secret knowledge with humanity. In this narrative, these angels defy God's authority to bring enlightenment to humans. Sound familiar? It echoes the idea of Satan as the ultimate rebel, defying divine order to bring freedom or knowledge. This might be one of the reasons the book didn't make it into the official canon, it directly challenges the tidy narrative of good versus evil by showing these figures in a more complex, even sympathetic light. Then there's the Gospel of Judas, discovered in the 1970s but dating back to the early days of Christianity. This text flips one of the Bible's most notorious stories on its head. Judas, the ultimate traitor, isn't the villain here. Instead, the Gospel portrays him as the one disciple who truly understood Jesus' mission. In this version, Judas didn't betray Jesus out of greed or malice, he was actually following Jesus' orders to hand him over, playing a necessary role in the divine plan. This portrayal is a far cry from the established narrative of Judas as the embodiment of betrayal and evil. No wonder the Church didn't want this text widely known, it messes with one of the foundational stories of Christian morality. Banned texts like these challenge the dominant narratives that institutions, particularly religious ones, have spent centuries reinforcing. If people begin questioning these foundational stories, the authority of those institutions comes into question. And that's exactly what these texts do, they spark doubt, inspire independent thought, and encourage people to seek truth beyond the officially sanctioned version. This isn't just a historical phenomenon. Even today, we see the banning or suppression of books that challenge religious or political orthodoxy. Take Salman Rushdie's The Satanic Verses. When it was published in 1988, it ignited global outrage. The novel reimagines key moments in Islamic history, questioning the divinity of certain revelations, and blurring the line between fiction and religious truth. 
The backlash was swift and brutal, a fatwa was issued against Rushdai, and the book was banned in several countries. Why? Because it dared to ask difficult questions about the nature of religious authority and interpretation. The banning of books is often a sign that those in power fear the potential for disruption. These texts introduce complexity, ambiguity, and alternative viewpoints that can undermine the simple, black and white narratives that have been used to control people for generations. And that fear isn't limited to religious institutions. Totalitarian regimes have long banned books that challenge their ideologies or expose inconvenient truths about their rule. Books that encourage people to think critically, question authority, or demand freedom are dangerous to any system that relies on unquestioning obedience. It's not just religious texts, though. Political and philosophical works have also faced suppression for challenging the established order. Take Karl Marx's The Communist Manifesto, which has been banned in numerous countries at various points in history. Governments that feared the rise of socialist or communist movements tried to silence the ideas in this text. Why? Because it presented a vision of society that radically opposed the capitalist systems that were in power. It was dangerous not because it was inherently violent or evil, but because it offered a different way of thinking about power, wealth, and class. So, when we look at banned books, we have to ask, what are the gatekeepers trying to protect? What are they so afraid we'll see or learn? The very act of banning a book often tells us more about the fears of the censor than about the content of the book itself. The fact that a text was considered dangerous enough to be banned suggests that it contains ideas powerful enough to challenge the status quo, and that's exactly why these books remain so compelling today. Books like the Book of Enoch, the Gospel of Judas, and the Satanic Verses are all examples of how literature can shake the foundations of belief and power. They force us to confront uncomfortable truths and reconsider what we've been taught. They serve as reminders that there's always more than one version of the story, and that the official version is often just the one that benefits those in power. If you've been paying attention, you'll have noticed that Satan has become a staple of modern pop culture. And no, I'm not talking about cult rituals in dark basements, this is mainstream now. From music to movies to TV shows, satanic imagery and themes have found a comfortable home in the cultural landscape. But why? How did the figure of Satan evolve from a religious boogeyman to a symbol of freedom, rebellion, and nonconformity that people actually relate to? Let's start with music. Heavy metal, especially bands like Black Sabbath, Slayer, and Marilyn Manson, has long embraced satanic themes. But it's not because these artists are out there worshipping the devil. It's much deeper than that. For many of these musicians, Satan is the ultimate symbol of resistance against the establishment. When they sing about Satan, they're really singing about breaking free from societal expectations and moral judgments that feel oppressive. It's about shaking up the status quo and embracing individuality. Bands use satanic imagery as a way to provoke, yes, but also to push boundaries and question authority. Look at someone like Ozzy Osbourne, his whole persona was built around shock value, but it was never just for the sake of being shocking. His music and stage presence tapped into something primal, the desire to rebel, to not be told how to live or think. When people saw Ozzy biting the head off a bat, it wasn't about Satanism in a religious sense. It was a statement against the restrictions of conventional society. It was about freedom. And for fans, it was cathartic. It allowed them to embrace a side of themselves that didn't fit within the rigid moral framework they grew up with. Now, take that same energy and look at movies. Films like The Exorcist or Rosemary's Baby helped fuel our cultural fascination with the dark and the demonic. In these movies, satanic forces represent a power that is uncontrollable, a force that upends the normal and exposes the fragile nature of the societal structures we rely on. In The Exorcist, the demon possesses a young girl, but the real horror isn't just in the supernatural, it's in how powerless the adults feel, how everything they believe in is called into question. It's not just about fear of the devil, it's about fear of losing control, fear of confronting the unknown. And this is what makes Satan so compelling in pop culture. He's the ultimate symbol of the other, the outsider who doesn't play by the rules. Whether you're watching a horror movie or listening to a metal album, satanic imagery serves as a reminder that there's a world outside the lines we've been taught to color within. 
In a culture that's increasingly driven by individual expression and the rejection of old norms, Satan isn't just a villain, he's a symbol of liberation. Even in TV shows like Lucifer, where the devil is portrayed as a charismatic anti-hero, the narrative has shifted. Here, Satan isn't pure evil, he's complicated, misunderstood, and, in many ways, more relatable than the forces of good that try to control him. He questions, he rebels, but he also loves, feels, and experiences moral dilemmas. This version of Satan reflects our own struggles with authority, morality, and the quest for personal freedom. It taps into a desire to explore the grey areas of life, where things aren't as black and white as traditional religious teachings would have us believe. In pop culture, Satan has come to represent freedom from oppression, the right to question everything, and the courage to live authentically. He's the ultimate icon for anyone who has ever felt trapped by societal expectations, religious dogma, or the moral judgment of others. And for that reason, Satan continues to thrive in music, film, and media, not as a symbol of evil, but as a symbol of defiance and individuality. The rise of Satan in pop culture isn't just about shock value or rebellion for its own sake. It's about the human need to push boundaries and challenge authority. It's about exploring the darker sides of ourselves in order to understand what makes us human. And in a world where traditional structures of power, whether religious, political, or cultural, are being questioned more than ever, Satan has become a powerful figure for those who seek to live life on their own terms. So, as Satan continues to evolve in pop culture, one thing is clear, he's no longer just the villain of the story. He's become a symbol of resistance, a figure that invites us to question everything we've been taught, and an icon for those who refuse to be controlled by fear. And in that way, Satan has become more relevant than ever, not as a religious figure, but as a cultural one. Thanks for sticking with us until the end. We hope this video gave you something to think about. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for more deep dives like this. Your thoughts are what make these discussions so interesting, so be sure to share them below. Thanks again for watching, and as always, God bless us all.